Israel-Hamas conflict. Israeli military kills Hamas militant featured in viral video. The Israeli military announced that it has killed Ahmed Fozi Wadia, a Hamas militant who was prominently featured in a widely circulated video from October 7. In the video, Wadia is seen drinking from a bottle of cola in front of two wounded children, just moments after a grenade attack that killed their father, Gil Tassa. Wadia, identified as a commander in a Hamas commando battalion and a member of a paragliding unit, was part of an attack on the community of Netiv Ha Asara. He flew into the area on a paraglider before launching the assault. In a disturbing video shown to journalists, diplomats, and lawmakers around the world, Tassa is seen protecting his sons by jumping on a grenade, sacrificing his life in the process. The Israeli military reported that Wadia was killed in an airstrike on Saturday that targeted a Hamas compound in Gaza City. The strike also killed eight other militants. The compound was near the Al Ali hospital, but the military stated that the hospital itself was not hit. However, the health ministry in Gaza reported that a strike on the hospital grounds resulted in three deaths. This development is part of the ongoing conflict between Israel and Hamas, which began on October 7 when Hamas-led militants launched a devastating attack that killed 1,200 people and took 250 hostages. The war, now in its 11th month, has claimed more than 40,000 lives according to Gaza health officials. Hamas threatens to execute hostages if Israeli forces get too close. Hamas has issued a chilling directive to its fighters holding Israeli hostages. If the Israeli Defense Forces, IDF, approach their location, the hostages are to be executed. This order comes in the wake of a June incident in which Israeli special forces successfully rescued four hostages in Gaza, known as the Nusayrat incident. Abu Obeda, a Hamas spokesman, emphasized that Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's strategy of military pressure, rather than negotiation, could result in the return of hostages in coffins. He made it clear that families must choose between their loved ones returning dead or alive. Hamas released this statement alongside a propaganda video featuring 24-year-old hostage Eden Yerushalmi, who was kidnapped on October 7 and tragically executed by Hamas in a Gaza tunnel last weekend, along with five other hostages. Yerushalmi, in the video, urged Netanyahu to strike a deal for the release of all hostages, referencing a 2011 agreement where over 1,000 Palestinian prisoners were freed in exchange for Israeli captives. The video was likely intended to taunt Yerushalmi's family, who had just buried her on the same day it was released. The brutal execution of the six hostages triggered a massive general strike in Israel, with hundreds of thousands protesting, demanding that Netanyahu's government negotiate a ceasefire and a deal with Hamas for the hostages' release. In a televised address, Netanyahu expressed deep sorrow to the families of the victims, apologizing for the failure to bring them back alive despite being close to doing so. He also vowed that Hamas would pay a very heavy price for these killings. On Tuesday, the IDF confirmed that airstrikes in Gaza City targeted and killed Ahmed Fozi Nazer Mohammed Wadia, a senior Hamas commander responsible for a deadly attack on the Israeli community of Netiv Ha Asara on October 7. Turkey arrests suspect accused of transferring money to Mossad operatives. Turkish authorities have arrested a suspect, Liradan Reksepi from Kosovo, who is accused of transferring money to operatives from Israel's Mossad intelligence agency. Reksepi entered Turkey on August 25 and was detained last Friday, with a formal arrest made on Tuesday. According to reports from Turkey's state-run Anadolu agency, Reksepi confessed during interrogation that he was involved in the money transfers. This arrest is part of a broader crackdown by Turkish authorities, who have detained dozens of people since January, including private investigators, on charges of gathering intelligence on individuals, primarily Palestinians living in Turkey, on behalf of Mossad. Israel has not made any public comments regarding these arrests. The arrest comes amidst heightened tensions between Turkey and Israel, particularly following the outbreak of the Israel-Hamas conflict in Gaza. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has been a vocal critic of Israel's military actions and has expressed support for Palestinian Hamas militants, labeling them as a liberation group. In response to the conflict, Turkey halted all trade with Israel in May and has applied to participate in a genocide case against Israel at an international court. 
Boris Johnson accuses Keir Starmer of abandoning Israel amid arms export suspension. Former UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson has sharply criticized Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer and Foreign Secretary David Lammy for suspending some arms export licenses to Israel. Johnson questioned whether Starmer and Lammy want Hamas to win the ongoing conflict, accusing them of abandoning Israel during a critical time. In a post on X, Johnson pointed out that Hamas still holds many Israeli hostages while Israel continues to prevent another massacre like the one on October 7. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu also condemned the decision, calling it shameful, and asserting that it would not deter Israel from defeating Hamas, which he labeled a genocidal terrorist organization. Netanyahu compared Israel's struggle against Hamas to Britain's stand against the Nazis, suggesting that history would view Israel's actions as essential to defending civilization. The UK has suspended around 30 out of 350 arms export licenses to Israel citing the risk that these arms could be used to violate international humanitarian law. The suspension has sparked outrage among conservative leaders as well, with former Foreign Secretary James Cleverly and former Security Minister Tom Tegendhat both criticizing the move. Tegendhat, visibly angry, accused the Labour government of standing against Israel's right to defend itself, particularly at a time when Israel is grappling with the aftermath of the October 7 attack. In the House of Commons, Foreign Secretary David Lammy explained that the UK government's review of arms exports was necessary due to legal obligations, although it could not determine whether Israel had breached international humanitarian law. He reiterated the UK's support for Israel's right to self-defense. Chief Rabbi Sir Ephraim Mervis also condemned the UK's decision, arguing that it feeds the false narrative that Israel is breaching international law when it is actually taking great care to uphold it. Despite the backlash, Defense Secretary John Healy assured that the suspension would not materially impact Israel's security and reaffirmed the UK's commitment to supporting Israel's right to defend itself. Some Labour MPs have called for a complete suspension of arms exports to Israel, with veteran MP Diane Abbott and others pushing for the ban to include parts for F-35 fighter jets. Iran's Supreme Court upholds death sentence for besieged member in 2022 protest killing. Iran's Supreme Court has upheld a death sentence for a member of the besiege, an all-volunteer wing of the Revolutionary Guard, who killed a 60-year-old man during the 2022 protests sparked by the death of Masa Amini. This ruling marks a rare instance of Iran holding its security forces accountable for their actions during the crackdown on dissent that followed Amini's death. The convicted besiege member, whose identity has not been fully disclosed, stormed the home of Mohammad Jamebozord in Karaj, searching for protesters, including Jamebozord's son. The besiege member shot Jamebozord in the head, resulting in his death. Two other guard members involved in the incident received prison sentences. The Iranian government and state media have not reported the ruling. The 2022 protests erupted after the death of Masa Amini a 22-year-old woman who died in police custody after being arrested by Iran's morality police for allegedly not wearing her hijab properly. The protests led to a brutal crackdown by the Iranian government, resulting in over 500 deaths and the detention of more than 22,000 people. This case is not the only instance where a member of Iran's security forces has faced the death penalty for actions during the Amini protests. In 2023, a military court sentenced Colonel Jafar Javanmardi, a police chief, to death for killing a young man, although his sentence is still under review by the Supreme Court. Iran's new reformist president, Masoud Pazeshkian, has focused on investigating cases of brutality by security forces. Last week, Pazeshkian ordered an investigation into the death of a man in custody after activists claimed he had been tortured by police officers. Lebanon's former central bank chief Riyad Salame arrested over financial crimes. Riyad Salame, Lebanon's former central bank governor, was arrested in Beirut on Tuesday over financial crimes related to a brokerage company. This marks his first arrest after years of accusations. Salame, who served as the central bank governor for 30 years, is facing charges of embezzlement, money laundering, and fraud linked to commissions earned through dealings with Optimum Invest, a Lebanese firm. Salame had previously denied any accusations of financial crimes. 
The charges on Tuesday are separate from earlier allegations involving another company, Foy Associates, controlled by his brother, Raja Salame. The two were accused of diverting $330 million in public funds through commissions. Despite facing charges in Lebanon and having arrest warrants issued against him in France and Germany, Salame had not been apprehended until now. He will be held for four days as a precautionary measure before the case is transferred to the Beirut public prosecutor. Salame's arrest follows a hearing at Lebanon's Justice Palace concerning the central bank's dealings with Optimum Invest. The company, which bought and sold treasury bonds and certificates of deposit with quick turnovers, has denied any wrongdoing, stating that a financial audit in late 2023 found no evidence of illegality. This arrest marks a significant fall for Salame, who was once a respected figure in Lebanon's financial system and even considered a potential presidential candidate. His downfall mirrors the collapse of Lebanon's financial system, which has been in crisis for the past five years. As Lebanon faces an appraisal by the Financial Action Task Force, Salame's arrest may be seen as an effort to show that action is being taken on financial crimes. Two U.S. Marines attacked during port visit in Turkey Two U.S. Marines from the USS Wasp were attacked during a port visit in Izmir, Turkey. The incident occurred while the Marines were off-duty and in civilian clothes. They were assaulted by a group of 15 individuals, consisting of two women and 13 men, who are members of the Turkish Youth Union. This group, which holds anti-American and anti-imperialist views, is linked to the nationalist Vatan Party in Turkey. The U.S. Embassy in Turkey confirmed the attack, stating that the Marines were safe, thanks to the rapid response of Turkish authorities. Other Marines in the area quickly intervened, and the two assaulted Marines were taken to a local hospital for evaluation. Fortunately, they were not injured and have since returned to the USS Wasp. Turkish authorities detained all 15 suspects involved, and a judicial investigation has been initiated. The USS Wasp had arrived in Izmir the day before for a scheduled port visit, and the incident is now under investigation by local authorities. Venezuelan opposition candidate Edmundo Gonzalez faces arrest warrant. Venezuelan authorities have issued an arrest warrant for Edmundo Gonzalez, a former presidential candidate and a key figure in the opposition movement. The warrant, requested by the Venezuela prosecutor's office, accuses Gonzalez of crimes associated with terrorism. These charges include usurpation of functions, forging a public document, instigation to disobedience of laws, and conspiracy. The arrest warrant comes after Gonzalez failed to respond to three summonses regarding an investigation into an opposition website that published election results. These results, which the opposition claims show a landslide victory for Gonzalez, challenge the official outcome of the disputed July 28 election, in which President Nicolas Maduro was declared the winner. The opposition, along with several international observers, has cast doubt on the legitimacy of these results. Gonzalez has denied the accusations, while opposition leader Maria Karina Machado has stated that these threats only serve to unite the opposition further. Despite the government's claims, Venezuela's electoral body has yet to provide full vote tallies to support Maduro's declared victory. The situation remains tense as the opposition continues to challenge the election results and the government's crackdown intensifies. U.S. close to providing long-range missiles to Ukraine but delivery delays expected. The United States is nearing an agreement to supply Ukraine with long-range cruise missiles, known as Joint Air-to-Surface Standoff Missiles, JASM, which could significantly extend Ukraine's reach into Russian territory. However, the delivery of these missiles is expected to take several months due to technical adjustments that need to be made before shipment. These powerful missiles, which can be launched from aircraft like the F-16s that Ukraine will eventually operate, have the potential to alter the strategic dynamics of the conflict. With a range of about 230 miles, or even longer for certain versions, JASSMs could allow Ukraine to target Russian military installations and supply depots deep within Russia, complicating Russia's ability to maintain its offensive operations. The Biden administration is carefully considering this move, weighing the risks of escalating the conflict further especially since Ukraine's allies have been cautious about allowing strikes deep inside Russian territory. Nonetheless, 
Providing these missiles could offer Ukraine a crucial advantage, particularly as it faces mounting pressure from Russian forces on the Eastern Front. While the introduction of JASSMs could bolster Ukraine's defense and offensive capabilities, it also raises questions about the potential impact on U.S. stockpiles and the broader implications for NATO and global security. Russia's deadliest strike on Ukraine this year kills 41 in Poltava. In the deadliest attack on Ukraine this year, at least 41 people were killed and over 180 injured when Russian forces struck a military institute in Poltava with two ballistic missiles. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky confirmed the attack and called for a full investigation, vowing that those responsible would be held accountable. The missiles targeted the Military Institute of Communications in central Ukraine, partially destroying one of its buildings and trapping many under the rubble. Rescue operations are ongoing, with 25 people rescued so far, including 11 pulled from the debris. The Ukrainian government highlighted the urgency for more Western air defense systems and long-range weapons to counter such attacks. Zelensky emphasized the critical need for these defenses to be deployed immediately, as every day of delay costs lives. This attack follows an increase in Russian missile and drone strikes on Ukraine, including recent bombardments of Kyiv. In response, Ukraine has targeted Russia with drones, damaging key infrastructure near Moscow. As the conflict intensifies, local authorities in Poltava have declared three days of mourning for the victims. The identities of those killed have not yet been disclosed. UN nuclear watchdog head visits Ukraine amid safety concerns at Zaporizhia plant. Rafael Mariano Grossi, the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency, IEEA, is in Ukraine for urgent talks regarding the safety of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Europe's largest nuclear facility. This marks Grossi's 10th visit to Ukraine since the start of the Russia-Ukraine war in February 2022. Grossi's visit comes amid renewed concerns following recent artillery shelling near the Zaporizhia plant. The shelling reportedly damaged the facility's power access, raising alarms about potential emergencies if further damage occurs. The operator of the plant, Energodom, has blamed the attacks on Russian forces and noted that technicians are unable to inspect the damage due to ongoing risks. An explosion at Zaporizhia could create radiation concerns, but analysts suggest the immediate risk would be relatively low compared to the 1986 Chernobyl disaster. Depending on wind direction, radiation could potentially be pushed towards Russia. The IAEA has expressed concerns about the ongoing threats to Ukraine's nuclear power infrastructure, including recent drone threats. Besides Zaporizhia, Ukraine operates three other active nuclear plants. In related developments, a Russian airstrike overnight targeted a hotel in Zaporizhia city, resulting in the deaths of an eight-year-old boy and a woman, with several others injured. Grossi, accompanied by IAEA experts, has started discussions in Kyiv with the Ministry of Energy to address these critical issues. Russia sentences hypersonic scientist to 15 years on treason charges. In a high-profile case, Russian physicist Alexander Shipluk has been sentenced to 15 years in prison on treason charges. Shipluk, the 57-year-old director of the Kristianovich Institute of Theoretical and Applied Mechanics in Siberia, was convicted on Tuesday after being arrested in August 2022. This sentence follows a series of treason cases involving experts in hypersonic missile technology. Shiplik's colleagues, Anatoly Maslov and Valery Zavegensev, have also faced similar charges, with Maslov receiving a 14-year sentence in May. The trial was held behind closed doors, a common practice in treason cases in Russia. Shiplik's defense has not yet announced whether they plan to appeal the verdict. The Kremlin has described the accusations as very serious and indicated that the matter falls under the jurisdiction of the security services. The charges stem from allegations that Shipluk shared classified information at a 2017 scientific conference in China, though he has claimed the information was publicly available. Russia views itself as a leader in hypersonic missile technology, which is known for its extreme speed and ability to penetrate advanced air defense systems. Shipluk and his colleagues are part of a broader group of Russian scientists facing similar treason charges, many of whom are accused of leaking sensitive information to China. 
Russia extends detention of French researcher accused of espionage. A Moscow court has extended the detention of French researcher Laurent Vinatier, who is accused of gathering military information for foreign intelligence and failing to register as a foreign agent in Russia. Vinatier, who could face up to five years in prison, was led into court on Tuesday, but his trial has been postponed to September 16 due to procedural issues. Vinatier's lawyer reported that the Frenchman had admitted guilt and requested a swift verdict. Despite this, the court rejected requests for bail or house arrest, extending his custody until February 21. Arrested in June by the FSB at a Moscow restaurant, Vinatier has been accused of using his extensive network of contacts to collect sensitive military information. The FSB claims this information could be used by foreign intelligence services, though Vinatier has not been officially linked to any state agencies. France has condemned Vinatier's detention as arbitrary and called for his immediate release. French President Emmanuel Macron has denounced the charges as part of a disinformation campaign by Moscow, emphasizing that Vinatier was not working for the French government. The arrest has further strained relations between Russia and France, already tense over other issues, including the investigation into Pavel Durev, the founder of the Telegram messaging app, by French authorities. Vinatier works for the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue, a Swiss-based organization that aims to resolve conflicts and advance peace efforts globally. Ukraine's anti-corruption agency fires official over leak case. Ukraine's National Anti-Corruption Bureau, NABU, has dismissed its first deputy over a suspected leak case. The NABU announced the decision on Tuesday citing actions by the deputy that allegedly aimed to discredit a whistleblower who reported potential information leakage. The dismissed official, Gizo Uglava, was named on the NABU's website but has denied any wrongdoing. Uglava has stated that he will seek to clear his name in court. According to Anastasia Radina, head of the Parliamentary Anti-Corruption Committee, the dismissal was due to the deputy pressuring the whistleblower. The leaked information reportedly compromised a major investigation into a government-funded road-building project. Addressing corruption is a critical requirement for Ukraine's bid for European Union membership, and public frustration with corruption remains high amid ongoing conflict with Russia. Starlink defies Brazilian court order to block X. Starlink, the satellite internet provider owned by Elon Musk, has informed Brazil's telecom regulator, Anatel that it will not comply with a court order to block access to the social media platform X in Brazil. This decision follows a ruling by the Supreme Court of Brazil, which ordered all telecom providers to shut down X due to its lack of a legal representative in the country. Starlink's response comes after its bank accounts in Brazil were frozen as part of a broader dispute involving unpaid fines linked to X's failure to submit required documents. Starlink which has over 200,000 customers in Brazil, is a subsidiary of Musk's SpaceX. The court's decision is set to be reviewed by a five-member panel, which experts believe will likely uphold the original ruling. Romania, Hungary, Georgia, and Azerbaijan launch Black Sea Power Line project. Romania, Hungary, Georgia, and Azerbaijan have announced a new venture to install a power line under the Black Sea aimed at boosting renewable energy supply to the European Union. The project, which gained traction following Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the EU's push to reduce dependence on Russian energy, will connect Azerbaijan's potential wind energy from the Caspian Sea to EU members Romania and Hungary. The initiative, approved in 2022, was officially launched in Romania's capital on Tuesday. Leaders from the four countries emphasized the project's importance for enhancing energy security and reducing electricity prices. Romania's energy minister Sebastian Berduha highlighted the strategic significance of diversifying Europe's energy sources, while Azerbaijan's energy minister Parviz Shabazov pointed out the project's role in addressing climate change by providing green energy. Bulgaria's deputy energy minister also participated in the meeting, with discussions about possibly joining the project. The next steps will be discussed at a UN climate change meeting in Azerbaijan later this year. Japanese Prime Minister Kishida to visit South Korea for final summit. Outgoing Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida is set to visit South Korea this Friday for what is expected to be his final summit with South Korean President Yoon Suk-yeol. 
The two-day visit comes as Kashida aims to end his term on a positive note regarding bilateral relations. The summit will mark the twelfth meeting between the leaders, focusing on enhancing ties and addressing regional and global issues. Kashida's visit follows a series of domestic challenges in Japan, including local election losses and a fundraising scandal, leading to his decision to step down after the Liberal Democratic Party selects a new leader on September 27. Kashida is anticipated to offer advice to his successor on maintaining and advancing Japan-South Korea relations. South Korean President Yoon has worked to resolve historical disputes with Japan while strengthening military and diplomatic ties with the U.S., especially in response to North Korean threats. The visit comes against a backdrop of complex historical grievances, including issues from Japan's colonial rule over Korea from 1910 to 1945. Yoon's administration has sought to address these tensions, notably through a controversial compensation plan for Korean forced laborers announced in March 2023, which has faced domestic opposition. New Zealand spy report highlights Chinese interference concerns. New Zealand's Security Intelligence Service has labeled China as a complex intelligence concern in its latest annual threat report, revealing vulnerabilities to foreign interference in the Pacific nation. The report details how China has engaged in malicious activity by using front organizations to influence local groups and replace genuine community perspectives with those aligned with the Chinese government. An example cited is a Chinese-language news outlet that echoed Beijing's viewpoints. This revelation comes as New Zealand's new center-right government adjusts its foreign policy to align more closely with Western allies, following years of strong economic ties with China, its largest trade partner. In March, New Zealand had publicly accused a Chinese state-sponsored group of being behind a 2021 cyber attack on government systems, an accusation China has denied. China responded to the report by denying any interference and urging New Zealand to maintain a rational view of its actions. The report also highlighted threats from other countries, including Russia, which is suspected of monitoring public statements and social media. It warned of attempts by unnamed nations to influence local councils and community events. Director General of Security Andrew Hampton emphasized that the report aims to inform New Zealanders of these threats to manage them effectively. Prime Minister Christopher Luxon has noted that New Zealand can no longer rely on its geographical isolation and stressed the need for a balanced approach to its relationship with China. U.S. and South Korea conduct major amphibious assault drill amid North Korean tensions. On Monday, the United States and South Korea executed a significant amphibious assault drill in Pohang, a city in southeastern South Korea, as part of their 13-day Sangyang exercise, also known as Double Dragon. This drill is aimed at demonstrating the strength and coordination of the Allied forces in response to escalating threats from North Korea. The exercise featured division-level landing forces operating from over 40 vessels, including South Korean transport ships Rocks Docto and Murado, and the U.S. amphibious assault ship USS Boxer. The drill also involved more than 40 aircraft and amphibious assault vehicles. During the media-accessible session, U.S. F-35B stealth jets and A-1Z attack helicopters flew overhead, simulating bombing runs along the coast. Amphibious assault vehicles then landed on the beach, supported by South Korean Marines, paratroopers from C-130 transport planes, and a British commando unit for the second consecutive year. This year's drill marked the first time a combined staff of South Korean and U.S. officers led the operation. Lt. Col. Gabriel Tiggs of the U.S. Marine Corps emphasized the importance of these joint exercises, stating that they are crucial for the defense of the Korean Peninsula and for maintaining a high level of coordination between the Allied forces. The drills come in response to ongoing high tensions with North Korea, which continues its weapons tests and provocative rhetoric. Recent North Korean developments include new suicide attack drones and an upgraded multiple rocket launcher posing a direct threat to South Korea and its capital, Seoul. The Sangyang exercise follows the recent conclusion of the Ulchi Freedom Shield joint drills, which Pyongyang condemned as preparations for invasion. North Korea argues that its weapons programs are a necessary deterrent. Trump Vance's ticket outpaces Harris Walls in media interviews. Since the formation of the Harris Walls ticket, former President Trump and his running mate, 
Ohio Senator J.D. Vance, have conducted a total of 34 interviews. In contrast, Vice President Kamala Harris and her running mate, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz, have given just one non-scripted interview during the same period. Trump and Vance have been actively engaging with the media, speaking with a wide range of outlets including Fox News, NBC News, and various podcasts. Trump has even had notable interviews with figures like Elon Musk. Vance has also been vocal, participating in interviews with major networks and shows. In comparison, Harris only recently broke her extended interview drought with a session on CNN last week, which was the first time she spoke with a journalist since before Walls was selected as her running mate. During her interview, Harris addressed some of her policy flip-flops and defended her stance on issues like fracking and immigration. Critics have noted that her performance in interviews has been mixed, with some past interviews, like her response on border policy in 2021, receiving backlash. Trump's campaign has criticized Harris for her lack of solo interviews and policy proposals, suggesting that her absence from the media spotlight highlights weaknesses in her campaign. Meanwhile, Vance's media presence contrasts with Walls's recent controversial decision to avoid answering questions from reporters about the deaths of Hamas hostages. As the election approaches, the candidates will meet for a debate on September 10 hosted by ABC News, which could provide another opportunity for Harris to address these concerns directly.